Ohio. Ohio is dead to me. Why? It knows why. Michigan. Michigan. Detroit Piston Tayshawn Prince hasn't missed a basketball game in three years. Way to perfectly attend, Tayshawn. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. The Ramada in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, is haunted by a ghost named Walter. Minnesota. <laughs> Kitty litter was invented here. North Dakota. Fastest growing population of people over 85. South, South Dakota. Dakota. Home of beloved Native American Crazy Legs, whose name in Lakota meant into the wilderness, but his friends just called him Curly. Wyoming. State dinosaurs, the Triceratops. Nebraska. Nebraska. When I was six, I went to the University of Nebraska State Museum in Lincoln. I saw the skeleton of a giant woolly mammoth. Best day of my life. Kansas. Kansas. Amelia Earhart was from Kansas. She was hot. Hubba hubba. Colorado. While traveling through the Rocky Mountains, Alfred Packer allegedly ate five of his traveling companions. University of Colorado named a cafeteria after him. The slogan, have a friend for lunch. New Mexico. Kevin Zucker's mom lives here. Texas. Houston postal worker Jefferson David McKissick spent 29 years of his life constructing a museum dedicated to his favorite fruit, the orange. He called it the Orange Show. It's pretty crazy, but in a good way. Nevada! In leaving Las Vegas, Nicholas K. decides to drink himself to death. He meets a cute prostitute. They make a deal where she's going to be cool with his drinking as long as he's cool with her whoring. Here's a scene where he crashes into a coffee table and gets covered with glass. Oh, 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 I'm a prickly pear! I'm a prickly pear! Idaho! Mashed potatoes supposedly cure hangovers. Montana. Montana. Rolling Stone called its governor, Brian Switzer, hot. Hubba hubba. Washington. Washington. Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18, 1980. Oregon. Jolie, my cousin, lives in Portland. She sends me earrings every year on my birthday. Too bad my ears aren't pierced. California. There's a 150-ton concrete dinosaur along the side of the road of Cabazon, California. It was recently bought by a bunch of creationists who don't even believe dinosaurs existed. There's a brain teaser for you. Hawaii. Hawaii. Kai means excellent in Hawaii, and it's also my last name. Alaska. Alaska! In Alaska, there are a lot of things. One of them is the world's largest chocolate waterfall. Watch out! Johnny? Yeah. So what did you, uh, you think? Did you like it? <laughs> that was amazing. You really think so? You liked it? I loved it. Thank you very much. I've been fletching. He's totally red right now. I was just trying to get all the blocking right so Starly wouldn't yell at me. <laughs> do, do you yell at him? I wanted to do really. I wanted to do it good. <laughs> he did good though. <sighs> that was great. Hey, uh, Starly, can I get that sandwich now? Oh yeah, one sandwich coming up. Here you go. Wait, this is it? Looks good, right? It's two pieces of white bread on a plate. What are you talking about? This doesn't look like a very good sandwich. Do you have any mustard? I don't have any mustard. I was expecting a deli quality sandwich. You, all you said was sandwich. Okay. You, didn't, you didn't get specific. Uh, guys, the I'm, I'm going to jump off here. here. In between the bread, not uh, the two thanks. pieces of bread. It looks like a sandwich. Settle that whole sandwich. Come into the room, they would say, oh, whose sandwich is that? I can't eat a dry sandwich. Who are you, Haley? No. You're awesome. Wednesday. It is perhaps a good thing that Starley has just given me a refresher course on the U.S. of A., as I am supposed to deliver a lecture there at a radio conference in Illinois on Friday. The thing is, though, that I still haven't finished writing it, and I'm nervous, so I call up my friend David, a Canadian living in New York, to share with him my concerns. I don't know what I have to teach news reporters and radio documentarians, I say. These are serious people professionals, journalists. I mean, I make radio dramas. It is at this point that David says he is going to stop me right there. I'm going to stop you right there. Wh what? This is in Chicago. I would, I would simply advise you to uh, use the American and or British pronunciation of the word D-R-A-M-A. -A. Drama. No. Drama. Drama. Yeah. You will just, you will just throw them from the roller coaster, if you say drama, you will lose them almost immediately. They will, they will think he said drama. Well, I mean, they know that I'm Canadian, so, I mean, maybe they'll yeah, find... Yeah, but of all the many charming Canadian pronunciations in the world, mm -hmm. that's not one of them. Nor is pasta. They don't, they wouldn't find that a little exotic? Yes, but exotic in all its sort of icky, ethnocentric, uh, 19th century anthropologist assumption kind of ways. No. Oh. Do you know what I mean? They would think that you were kind of lesser, less intelligent than you actually are. Right. Can you say drama trippingly off your tongue? Try it. 
trauma. Yeah, it's it's. No. I'm gonna forget. I mean, I'm not gonna. Then be what I would advise you to say is, uh, something along the lines of like, I don't know why I'm here at a reporting, you know, essentially a radio documentary festival, because what I essentially do are little radio plays. So just avoid. Yeah. Uh, avoid the drama. Yeah, avoid the word drama. It's the way. It's the way. Like when someone says um, instead of whore, they say whore. Yeah, that's off-putting. Doesn't it make you think that, yeah, that they come from an inbred population who've been, you know, drinking the local bilge water and thereby trace metals and all that? And you think, and you think this is comparable? It, it, sounds, it sounds sort of small town. And there's some charm there. Yeah. But with all those small town values. Right. Oh, God. Don't get me started on small town values. No. Sorry. But that's, that's just my little bit of advice to you. On top of everything I'm nervous about, David has also made me worried that I'm going to show up seeming like a Lederhosen-clad foreign exchange student. Thursday. Still worried about the lecture, I wake up out of a dream in which the venue has been changed at the last minute from Evanston, Illinois, to my parents' basement. Instead of a podium, my notes sit on a pile of old TV guides. The only people in attendance are my parents and Howard Stern. He is dressed in an American flag top hat like Uncle Sam. As I nervously read through my notes, the room grows smaller and smaller until finally I am nose to nose with Stern. I see my reflection in his round mirrored sunglasses and it is not a pretty sight. Saturday. I've completed my lecture and it went off with no major gaffes and so I'm feeling pretty happy. Highlights include someone pointing out that I have shaving cream on my earlobe and being told by a hunched bespectacled man that he used to have a sports jacket exactly like mine until his ex-wife made him throw it out. In such moments I am reminded that the beauty of radio is that you cannot be seen. Back at my hotel room I take a victory bath. It's something akin to a victory lap, except without clothes and all that running. I love taking baths, but hardly ever get to have a proper one because my tub at home is about the size of one of those buckets in which cowboys soak in old westerns. While my home tub does succeed in making me feel like a big man, in much the same way that drinking from a tiny espresso cup does, and I never have to worry about falling asleep and drowning, it would be as difficult as drowning in a shallow bowl of consomme, it does feel like a treat to have my legs and arms wet at the same time. I sink beneath the water, and for the next several seconds, I bask. Sunday. As I am checking out of the hotel, the clerk looks at my file and says, Canada, eh? The other white meat. I laugh. But my laughter is mostly out of gratitude for not having been charged for the $5 bottle of minibar water I accidentally opened the night before. I continue to laugh as I slowly inch backwards towards the door, towards Canada, towards friends, and towards family. Hello? Hey, Dad. Why are you calling me on the other line, Johnny? Oh, I'm sorry. Because I said I don't like to talk on this phone. Oh, how come? It gives me a headache, I think. Well, how, how come it gives you a headache? I don't know. There's something in maybe the airwaves, the electrical waves or something, these cell things. I doubt you can get a headache from a cell phone. Well, I don't know. I'm starting to get one right now. <laughs> okay, I'll call you back. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Anyway, so how was your trip in uh, Illinois? It was uh, it was good. Um, it uh, It was nice, but... It's, uh, but it's also, you know, it also feels good to be back in Canada. I'm glad you're back and your trip was safe. Yeah. Hey, um, how long has it been since you've been, uh, living in Canada? Since 73, so it's about 35 years. Wow. So it's almost half your life. Uh, yes, almost half my life. I mean, would you, would you have ever imagined, you know, when you, when you were, when you were, you know, growing up in, in, in Brooklyn that you would have ended up an, an older man in Canada? 
In reality, no. 